let's get the show started. Um, today's uh, movie, or I should say this month's movie, was God's <laughs> Stepchildren. A uh, fairly controversial movie, even in its time uh, in the late 30s. And I have to confess, I had to, you know, watch certain sections of this movie several times to really catch what was going on and so on and so forth. But <clears throat> my comments for later, who wants to start? Don't all raise your hands at once. <laughs> I will. Go for it. Well, um, oh, right. Carol Nolan speaking. Uh -huh. I just okay. wanted to say this was really interesting. Um, I enjoyed the last two just for the history of it, but this was a much more complex, um, much to think about plot than the previous ones were. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting, good choice. Well, thank you. Like I said, it was uh, very controversial. Well, uh, Ron, um, this is Kara. Yeah. And um, Margaret and I watched this last night and I agree, it was a very interesting film. I felt the same way. There were parts of it I had to listen to several times in order to catch what was going on. But um, I was interested in people's reactions uh, to the opening scene because I found it one of the most perplexing. Mm -hmm. And I understand that um, uh, families would sometimes give up their children who were lighter or darker to be raised by someone else. Um, but uh that scene was so um it left so many questions up in the air about the young woman who was giving up the child and how she selected the person who she didn't seem to know before that to take the child um and so i just wondered if you could comment on that yeah well it's my guess and I think, uh, well, i'm sorry go ahead uh, yeah i yeah. think i the reason is that Mrs. Saunders must have had a very good um, reputation in the neighborhood. And um, uh, so somebody <clears throat> sent this young woman to her. What I would like to say about this is it's, it's very unfortunate that it's such a bad, bad copy. Mm -hmm. yeah. We are all saying we had to watch some episodes several times to really get it. Um, it's interesting that it was a... Um, movie that sparked some sort of great discussion because that was already, you know, I after I saw it, thought about it, I, I read some materials about it. It was actually done a year or two after the imitation of life. Mm -hmm. Treats a very, very similar issue, although there is not a small child that is uh, this, uh, uh, but it's also passing and um, one thing which didn't really strike me as such right away is that it also uses the, the theme of a child accusing a teacher, which uh, Lillian Hellman did in yes. Children's Hour. I was about to bring that up. You're correct. They and did. That's, yeah. that's really, that is really very interesting, putting these two themes into, into one movie. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think a children's hour came out maybe a year or two before this one did. So, uh, Possibly, yeah. yeah, Mitchell may have gotten the idea from that, I'm guessing. But uh, yeah, I did think of that. Yeah, that's what I saw that he actually got the ideas from both of these films. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I'm not saying he wasn't original, but he may have uh, decided to use it slightly differently. Mm -hmm. Found a very annoying, if I may say, is the score. There were so many really classical pieces of music, which to me had nothing to do with the action. Any comment on that from anybody musical here? Sure. Some of the music that was used was uh, was also used at the same time in uh, Flash Gordon movies. I thought that was pretty topical, yeah. appropriate. Mm. Did notice that. Yeah. Uh, about the comment about the quality of the film, um, I did notice that too, and that was distracting. I'm not sure how much of that is due to film deterioration and how much is due to the way the film was, uh, you know, filmed in the first place. I think I mentioned no. a couple of films ago that Mitchell wasn't exactly working with top rate 
uh, equipment. So he had to make do with what he had. And so the print may have been, you know, substandard to begin with. And over the last 80 years, it uh, evidently lost more. So uh, that may have, you know, contributed to the difficulty in watching it. Yeah, it, also shows you, it shows you where the restoration money is going to. Yeah. In the world. Mm -hmm. I was really struck oh, oh. by the fact that um, in several of the scenes, one or two of the characters really put down the black race and its capacity to do things and you know, even stated that the Negro is lazy and the Negro is this, that and the other. It was really awful. Mm -hmm. That's one reason why I showed this film. I'll, I'll comment on that, but I want to hear yeah. other comments. But at the same time, there was a great, to me, great celebration of the lazy black in, yeah. those, wonderful, in those wonderful nightclub scenes. When yeah. you had, uh, uh, who, who was the dancer? Do you know anybody? I, 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 I do not know. Yeah. I'll come um, on that as well, but I don't but know. They were, these were uh, really very, very excellent uh, uh, numbers there. Yeah. It, it kind of showed that uh, Yes, it's true that it's only the black audience who goes to watch the mm -hmm. black entertainment. But uh, I mean, we know that that was uh, superior to a lot of white entertainment anyway in those years. And uh, I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would go along with what Carol said. This picture was especially uh, approaching to me in that it was a family story and it took me right in. I could identify with it. The other one was uh, about murder and things that were complicated in a different way. This one was certainly complex as well, but it was a family story and I, I liked that. And it was um, wonderful how the woman took the baby in right away and loved her and yeah, right. raised her as her own child. And then of course, as the story develops, we see what happens. It's happened, yeah. I, I won't go into it. But I, I, I was very taken by it. I thought it was a good picture. But yeah. also, as somebody else said, at first I had trouble with it because I had difficulty understanding it. And then as I watched it through the second time, it became easier to comprehend. And I think that's the quality of the filmmaking back in the 1930s when this was made and possibly just this particular rendition but i think that back then they didn't have the same technology that we have today no certainly not in the black community tona you had your hand yeah. up no i was just um about the the quality i think the digitization was probably um you know when you digitize black and white with dark scenes it really comes out with those giant pixels and it's really annoying but yeah. but, but my comment about the film um that i found interesting was how the the main characters tended to be extremely light skinned and and you know since it's a movie about passing it seemed really interesting and strange and then the background characters were much more you know dark skinned and the character who she does not want to be married to is like almost a caricature yeah right <laughs> she denigrates them she uh, yeah. calls them ugly and she calls them ugly yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of why I, that was one of the main purposes in my showing the film. I, I had mentioned this uh, last month or the month before, how this did exist in the, uh, in black communities, even in my time, you know, going back to the 50s and 60s, although fortunately that was all, you know, coming to a close. But back then in the 30s, um, keep in mind, there were black people watching this movie. They would have understood that perfectly. Because mm -hmm. back then, if you were black but had light skin, you were preferred, not only by white people in terms of getting a job or whatever, but by black people also. And that's what you saw right. in the, uh, you know, the daughter, the stepdaughter, you know, really denigrates the person her stepbrother wanted to marry, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and that's, that's exactly, that was real. I mean, that, that sort of thing did happen. The darker your skin, the more rele relegated to the background you were mm -hmm. in the black community by an awful lot of black, not by everybody, of course, but yeah, that was the common, the common thing back then. Mm -hmm. It was a way of surviving and passing. 
and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. um, I noticed with the dancers that the two dancers on the sides were much blacker than the women in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yes, you would have found that, um, and that's again, that's real because yeah. even in the Cotton Club, even in you know, even in the uh, uh, the uh, nightclubs where only white people went or were allowed to go, the dancers were you know, either light skinned or light brown. You know, the darker dancers were in the back on the yeah. sides or just not there at all. That's that's the way it was. Even Another thing temporary. that was interesting about, sorry, go Debbie. No, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just gonna say about the dancing, um, I might not have noticed it, Ron, if it hadn't been for the previous time, but, <clears throat> but suddenly there's a dance. You know, yeah, we just talked about it last time, and right. somebody asked me who the dancers were or if I knew, and uh, no, I don't. And I'm not too surprised that I don't because, in I think, in just about every movie, regardless of the you know, uh, what the movie was about, somebody breaks out in the dance, and in the black <laughs> movie, but that's always, you know, yes. that's that's yeah. they, they would have, uh, you know, been very used to that also. Um, because keep in mind, one of the things that black people were relegated to doing it, uh, to doing, not that relegated is the correct word, was entertainment. Mm -hmm. You know, black people, uh, white people looked at black people for entertainment, you know, particularly dancing, you know, singing came second and so on and so forth. Um, and black people appreciated that also. So to throw in a dance in the middle of a dramatic movie was not that unusual. I think every movie we saw so far that mm -hmm. has happened. And but the in this movie, you know, it's, it's for right. dramas. And, uh, and yet, all of a sudden, somebody is, you know, we're in a nightclub and we're dancing for whatever reason. But that was very natural. In this movie, you go to a nightclub and there is performing dance, people are performing, and then everybody is dancing as well. That's part of the nightclub scene. Yeah, but you have to think. It's Why are we in a nightclub? <laughs> you have to put the nightclub there to have the dancing. Uh, yeah, it felt like a little, uh, no, like the little yeah. plot thing. It was like, oh, let's go to the city. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh oh, this is so that they can have a dance club. All of a sudden, we're in a nightclub. And you know what else is there to do in a nightclub but to dance and, and, and such like that? I kept waiting for the young girl to be up there as a dancer. I kept waiting for her to have gone to New York and become a dancer herself. That could have been a subplot. Yeah, I didn't think of that. But yeah, that could no. have happened. That, that could have been something. Uh, Misha, I think you had your hand up. Yes, well, uh, I wanted to say two things. First of all, unfortunately, this is the first time that I became aware of this series. So this is the first film that I'm watching with you. What were the other two films you already covered? Yeah, the other two films uh, really took place in the city, in Harlem, presumably. And uh, they were- but what, what, type, what were they? They were mysteries, basically. I, that's a very tight nutshell, but they were- dramas, mysteries, you know, whodunits almost. Also by Michelle? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I see. Okay, also, okay, okay. Also by Michelle, yeah. Mm -hmm. All Michelle. right. If you, go, if you go to the library's event calendar, sorry, yeah. uh, and go back to the last month, it's still in there. Oh, can... okay, okay. Yeah, now I have to get into it so that I get notified of all the events and... Uh, yeah. I have a question for people. I didn't quite get this. In the early part of the movie, the uh, the young girl uh, has a secret that she tells everybody that gets the teacher into trouble. Does anybody know what she said? What what got the teacher into trouble? I have an idea. I have a guess. I have oh, a guess. It's, it's, I think they maybe said the, uh, Mrs. The, the maybe the 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 mother um, beat her even worse than the teacher. Yeah, the teacher spanked her in that kind of absurd way, but maybe the mother beat her, gave her a real beating, and so she's saying, "Oh, the teacher." So no, I don't, I don't think I don't no. think that was that, Tonya. I think it was. Uh, we saw that again. It's the quality of the of the print, but there was a short scene after these parents came to uh, take yeah. the children away. There was this teacher with another woman and they were whispering to each other. And I think that's what that Naomi used, that these two women were lovers or something like that. 
I and, thought that Bill, you were going to elaborate on that. Yeah, I, I thought that was pretty clear when they went to see the superintendent of schools to get everybody yeah. fired. I think they said that the rumor was that the teacher and the principal were doing the nasty. Yeah. Yeah, I, the, yeah. yeah the teacher and the, and the principal were doing That's what it. I got. <laughs> uh, was the principal male or female? I must have missed that. The principal was male. Yeah. He was standing right there. Okay. He was standing in front of the yeah. yeah. middle of the class. Yeah. Yeah. All right, because I... I kind of got that the second or third time I reviewed that scene, but I didn't hear what you heard. You know, I guess the quality of the film, but I, I got the idea that she had an affair with someone, That's uh, right. probably the principal. Well, if you go back to if you go back to what somebody said before about the children's hour, that yeah. for those of you that don't know what that's that story, that's what that's about. But in yeah. the version in the version that was done in the '30s, that they mentioned on the um, I guess the the copy that we saw the other night had a uh, um, a trailer and it said something like in this, you know, what, what shocked the world in, in imitation of life and, and these three, these three was the first version of the children's hour that was done oh, in the 30s. Oh, that's right, yeah. And okay. in, in that version of it, they took the two female teachers and the thing between them, they took it out because it was the 30s and they made it a, um, where one of them, I guess the younger teacher was so the, the rumor was that, that she was sleeping with the older teacher's boyfriend. So they did make it kind of a conventional triangle thing or whatever you call that. So I think that's what he was copying. So it, it was pretty clear to me, at least, that it was the teacher and the principal that the young girl was putting together. And I would wonder greatly how that played in the black community where this was shown. And I have no idea, but it, it would have been interesting mm -hmm. because I think there would have been a difference uh, there was a difference, uh, you know, in the children's hour and such when these things were, you know, dealt with, however, obliquely. Uh, it did have an effect in the white community. It was controversial. And I wonder how this would have played in uh, in 1938 when the movie was made in the black community. I, I, I don't know. But interesting. I had to, you know, replay it like, two or three times just to get that, you know. So, Are anyway, there... Are there reviews or anything that can be found? Like if you searched on, you know, I don't know, newspaper archives or anything? I didn't do that. Uh, that would be interesting to, to, to do. Um, keep in mind though, again, this is a black film shown in black communities. Not that white people couldn't see the movie. I mean, nothing stopped them, but I mentioned a couple of months ago that white people may not have even known about this since it wasn't advertised um, in the white community. So if there was a review, it would have been in the black press. In New York, that would have been the Amsterdam News. So if I went back in, in the archives, if they even exist to see if uh, there were movie reviews, it's a good idea. I mean, I will do that. I, it didn't occur to me. But again, it would have been in the black press only. Right. Well, interesting to check. And then Chester had their hand up earlier. Yeah, go for it. Me? Yeah. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot what I thought. Oh, well, one thing, uh, going back to the dance scene, I think it was the very first dance scene with uh, all the dancing girls. Um, did anybody notice that there was, a, I don't know, maybe 15 light-skinned dancing girls and one dark-skinned? Yes. I wonder if anyone noticed, and I wonder what they made. Yes. Of. I'm not sure how much of that was in film degradation, though. No, no. no thanks, so. Oh, yeah, that was that was clearly clearly. She was mm -hmm. she was on the right. I have, I have my own opinion about it. I think it was deliberate. I I agree with you. I think it was deliberate to put her because there was no back. It's one line, so to put her as far to the right or to the left as possible, where she would be least okay. noticed. Uh, is, uh, yeah, this is the nineteen. This is 1938, so the Cotton Club had been around for quite a while, and the oh, Cotton yeah. Club was notorious for having all black entertainers, all white audience, and all of the dancing girls. It was, it was, they were infamous. All of the dancing girls had to be light skinned. Exactly. You couldn't get a job as a dancer unless you were light skinned. Yeah, yeah. The only exceptions to that were uh, if you were kind of a comic figure or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. You couldn't be one of those dancing girls if you had dark skin. No, you couldn't. No, you couldn't. And in this film, yeah, I noticed the uh, the dark skinned girl on the right. Um, and again, she's in a position where you might or might not notice her. Certainly, she's not prominent. 
And, uh, you know, even in the, like I mentioned earlier, even in the black community, dark skinned people were kind of looked down upon or relegated to the back or, you know, that sort of thing. So, you know, I, I think I mentioned a couple of films ago that there was prejudice in the black community against certain black people. Yes, yes, I have a, I have a friend who is from uh, South Africa. Mm -hmm. and I mean, the stories that he used to tell about the, you know, there is really black, black, then there is a kind of a not so black, and then you have the, um, uh, what is it called? What are we the color colors. Yeah, the colors. The colors, yeah. That, the, that the, the, the relationship is just really awful between yeah. them. Exactly. The, exactly. Prejudice is the, the, the prejudice is that the black guy has against the blacker guy guy is probably worse than the whites against the blacks in general. Probably not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> well, that's why they, that's why he says, that's why they would beat those really black guys in Johannesburg because they were, the, the really black ones were the reason for all the trouble. It, it was. Well, I think in, um, in South Africa, you know, during apartheid, um, there were several divisions of what we would call black people. In America, we're all black, okay? But in South Africa, there were the coloreds, then the black. Yeah. I mean, there were three or four divisions of black yeah. people and they kind of preyed on one another in, in the communities and whatnot. So uh, it's a little, different, a little different there than it was here. And the only thing that's comparable is that in Louisiana, um, if you go back before the Civil War, there were several divisions of black people. There were blacks, mulattoes, uh, octoroons, mm -hmm. whatever. And during Reconstruction, everybody became black, you know, but there were several divisions of people that were non-white who had dominion over other non-white, you know, mm -hmm. divisions and even had names, like I said, octoroon or, you know, mulatto. Uh, there, there were a number of names. But also high yellow. High yellow. Well, and, high yellow and that is the, child also being yeah. not as well accept, as accepted in their own family. Well, high yellow was used throughout. I mean, I I heard that uh, expression even in my even in my community. If you right. were yellow, that meant you had lighter skin. Right. You know, you could probably pass for white if you were high yellow, and that was yeah. a derogatory term. I was thinking of the musicians also. Louis Armstrong was very black, very mm -hmm. humorous. But if you look at Cab Calloway and some of the other um, popular musicians, a lot of them were lighter. Actually, yes and no. Because if you look at Count Basie and people like that, it really, really depended. Um, it depended on the music, you know, uh, pretty right. much. Yeah, Cap yeah, Calloway had lighter skin and he had straight hair, but if you look at his uh, orchestra, you know, a lot of them were darker, you know, some of them were darker skinned or, you know, whatever. So I don't think it mattered that much. Um, what did matter is that your band was all black or all white. They were not integrated, at least not in public, you know. Uh, Benny Goodman had integrated combos and whatnot, but they you know, for recording purposes only. Anyone else? I, I like a different topic I have. Um, I wanted, this This is different from what we're talking about skin color, but I, I wanted to go to the topic of history repeating itself, mm -hmm. where in the end, the sort of bad seed daughter brings her baby back to be raised by the same woman and it's like maybe it's going to start all over again i did get that when i saw that I, I i thought you know full circle and somebody asked a question earlier about you know uh, why the woman gave uh, in the beginning of the film why the woman gave up her baby to the teacher and i think somebody did answer the question with the thought that i had she's a teacher and if you're talking about a small community, teachers have prominence uh, right. and they're respected. So if you're going to give your baby to anyone, you're going to give uh, give up your baby to someone you believe yeah. will 
take care of the baby. And what surprised me though in the film is how quickly she did. You right. know, you know, it, it didn't take her more than a couple of minutes to accept the child and raise her as her own. And I don't know, I, I would have thought you'd have uh, given it a bit more thought and <laughs> a bit more conversation. You know, but it didn't work out that way. I, you know, but yeah. Well, I, it was very sweet. If you would think about the um, the brother who was already part of the family. Yeah. He has a stepsister um, that he didn't expect. It was very sweet at the end when Naomi brings back this child that she had from the dark skinned man and she didn't want to have this baby. And the baby was accepted by the same woman that had taken Naomi in. And it was very sweet how the, the little boy wanted to play with the others and they played Ring Around a Rosie, which most of us of course know. And it was a very warm, loving environment that they came into, I thought. Mm -hmm. Sure, Linda, you were going to say. Something. I think that I just wanted to know what 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 makes you think? Why do you think that Mrs. Sandburn was a teacher? Yeah, I didn't either. Yeah, I didn't get that she was a teacher either, Linda. No, I didn't either. Oh. No, no. But what is interesting about Mrs. Sanders is that she didn't question the whiteness of the baby. She just, oh, what a darling little baby, and she took it without. There was absolutely no expression of surprise on her face when she looked at the baby and had a black mother. Yeah. Well, she was obviously she was just a wonderful woman. She was, yes, exactly. I think uh, I don't think that it's defined what her profession okay. is. Okay, yeah, she's good. obviously a very well-respected woman in the community. She's looked up to. She's recommended or whatever. So, so this woman right. is comfortable to bring her child to her, and yeah. feels that she'd be the type of person who would take her child. Um, in, in a, <laughs> I mean, at first she's just like, "Can you kind of take the child for the evening?" And then the next thing, it's like, "Forever, I'm leaving. Yeah, Goodbye. Forever. Thanks. I Goodbye. won't see you again." Yeah. <laughs> And then at the end, I was like, oh, so this woman just gets another baby. <laughs> she, just, <laughs> she just collects them. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but just since I have the floor for a moment, um, I wanted to get back to the dancing. And I was just, um, so the, 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 you know, there's the chorus line dancing, there's the tap dancing mm -hmm. um, we've seen before. But what we haven't seen before is the very um, exotic. erotic, er exotic dancing. Yes. The woman that is dancing is scantily clad. I, I think that would have drawn eyes today. And this is 1938. I mean, she barely has anything on at all. And she's moving very, very sensually. And that, that caught me. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, I had to keep reminding myself because you think, wow, 1938, how could they even get away with that? But that was really before the censor laws. You couldn't get away with that in the movies in the 50s. Actually, in the 50s, she couldn't even be in the same bed, right? But, but uh, yeah, so, so it had something to do with the time that you could get away with that. Well, well you could not because the censors, and I think Bill might have something to say about this. The censorship started in the 20s, but I in think- the movies, black really? the, And the Hayes Commission started the in the early 30s. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I think the black films uh, just got under the radar. Yeah, I mean, they just weren't noticed by the censors, so you could do almost anything. But the, uh, <laughs> the censors started, you know, the idea of censorship, and I could go on and on about this, and I promise I won't. But the uh, the movie industry nearly came to a halt in the 1920s, in the early 20s at that, for any number of scandals, drugs, and nudity in films, you know, uh, to the point where church groups got up in arms about it and whatnot. And by that time, the movies are making millions of dollars. So rather than abolish the whole thing, you know, they decided to, uh, you know, have a censor, you know, censor everything and, and that sort of thing. And that, that predates this by almost 20 years. But like I said, the uh, black films probably just got under the radar. Who's gonna notice right, a yeah. movie yeah. for black people aside from black people, and they probably aren't going to complain. Yeah, the Hays Code came into effect in 1934. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that is, the, that the, Hays Code, 
the Hayes Code and what everybody thinks of as censors now, um, with the, what was called the production code at the time, was really self-imposed by the movie industry yeah. mm -hmm. to keep the government out of their business. So this was not a studio film. Therefore, nobody connected with the Hayes office or the production code people would have been involved in this. Nobody would have been looking at it. Yeah. Yeah, Mitchell had the, you know, he, he was a production company. I mean, he, he was distribution, you know. I'm sure he had people helping him, but uh, they certainly weren't company people. You know, so they flew in under the radar and could do what they want. But that did shock me when that woman came out and danced. Like I said, that would raise eyebrows today, you know, let alone 80 years ago, uh, you know, whatever. But then there was Josephine Baker, so I don't think we would be shocked today. <laughs> well, Josephine Baker was- well, she was in front. Right. And, and, and it's okay, but- it. and By this time, Josephine Baker was in France. That's right, she was, but still, we know yeah. that it can be done, and it was. <laughs> yeah, in fact, she went to France in the 20s, you know, I mean, she was long gone by this time. But it gives you an idea of what the entertainment industry was like back in the 20s and before. You know, Josephine Baker's a good example. Anyone else? Um, I just want to comment that um, at the same time that we were watching this and all the other films that we've been doing with you, yeah. Um, we ha we happened to watch a film. It was put up at uh, the Harlem Roots Festival. I sent you the link. I don't know if you saw. They were doing a, a series of um, of um, films with with black um, actors, and so one film I can't remember the name of it, but it was Ethel Waters was the star, and mm -hmm. little Sammy Davis Jr. <laughs> he was about this big, dancing, and he was so cute. Um, but was really really struck me was that was a Hollywood film. It was a studio film. And the language, the, 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 the stereotypical dialogue compared to what we've been seeing in these black films by black artists yes. was extraordinarily different. I mean, they, the sentence, you know, he, you know, I can't even emulate, I can't even imitate the, the bad way that they had everybody speaking, the dialogue in this, in this studio movie. The black dialogue. So it's basically the Amos and Andy syndrome again. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, I, I think I may have mentioned, if not, I will now, that uh, if you're looking at a basically film produced by white people, which is what you're describing, any black people in the film would have been stereotypical, which is quote unquote what white people wanted to see at the time or what white people expected to see. Oddly enough, the uh, the black language, you know, the stereotypical language that you talk about, nobody spoke that way. Those actors had to be coached to speak quote unquote black English by white people, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. What you see in the Mitchell films is how black people actually spoke. Right. Because this would have been crazy. Yeah. You know, it's for, not, yeah. It's starkly different. And, and, and this, this Ethel Waters film was an all black cast. So yeah. everybody for the whole time, Two, hour, two hours we were watching it was speaking this horrible, uh, you know. It may have been an all black cast, but who wrote the uh, screenplay? Oh yeah, absolutely. It was a Hollywood movie, no doubt. You know, this, but even in, the, even in the black films, you do have your stereotypical people. You know, you do have right. gradations we talked, of- We talked about people. that last week, uh, with yeah. the last movie, yes. Yeah, you know, because believe it or not, black people were entertained by that also. Uh, mostly because they knew that most black people didn't speak that way. You're playing a role. White people saw it as, you know, a lot of white people saw this as uh, completely different. This is how black people talk. Well, the farmer... and realistically, where did these black people learn their English? Many of them lived with standard uh, white folks and some uh, but we, and we went back we talked about this last time too so Journa truth was raised in a dutch family if anything she could have had a dutch accent or, or an english accent rather than this what we assume to be southern black speech well i think i mentioned uh, earlier also you know and i think i mentioned uh, you know maybe a month or two ago that uh, even in my neighborhood in harlem you know in the 50s and 60s you had people that had lived there forever who spoke like everybody else, you know, I mean, you live in America, yes, you, you sound like an American, you know. Um, you had people from the West Indies, where my family was from, and they sounded different. And then you had people from the South, 
who sounded very different to us. And, uh, and that's where the stereotype comes from. Um, I think uh, uh, they were at the, in the third, 20s and 30s, people assumed that all black people came from the South and spoke a Southern, a corrupted Southern English. You know, the white equivalent would be hillbillies and you know, that, that sort of thing. And, but even in my neighborhood, the uh, people in the, uh, who had Southern accents uh, were looked down on, unfortunately. I mean, any kid that ended up in my class with a Southern accent, um, his nickname was automatically country because he, it, it assumed that everything south of Kentucky was the country, you know, and even though he could have come from the most urbanized, you know, uh, city in the south or whatever. But yeah, in the, uh, in the black community, that was noticed. And, uh, you know, for white people, this was entertainment. This is how they wanted to assume that black people spoke. So even though it might be an all black cast, like I asked earlier, you know, who wrote the screenplay? Who's directing the movie? It's not a black person. So with any of the Mitchell or similar movies, um, what you're getting is a variety of black speech if you pay attention, um, given where, you know, black, given the role they're playing and, and this sort of thing. So you will get the stereotypical speech, but you will also get, you know, um, rather proper English. And in this you know, uh, movie again. The 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 brother speaks, you know, pretty good English, and as do most of the people. You know, um, so that that's kind of the way it was. Yes, Alan. No, oh, Ron. Hang on. Uh, Megan had her hand up first. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to jump the gun. Um, well, actually, on on that topic, I thought it was interesting that the farmer um, Clyde, the one who married married Naomi, <laughs> did speak differently from the vast majority of the rest of the characters. And, um, yeah. But the thing that I was actually trying to bring up, and I apologize if this is said already, because I got home a few minutes after seven. Um, but um, at the very end, like we already talked about the the cycle of the. Uh -oh. You're muted. Unmute yourself. <laughs> okay. Did it was muted the whole time? No, just half of it. <laughs> <laughs> you um, left it you left off with at the very end and then you started to gesture so maybe that's a good place for you to pick up i think that's what happened i hit it um at the very end with the um the the baby being um given uh again uh i guess i was i was interested in what happened to naomi i was i was assuming mm -hmm. that she maybe jumped off a bridge that i couldn't see very well and with the grief with what you saw at the end but i was wondering if other people had different opinions of that after she watches her son through the window i have my yeah. opinion but i'll let other people she became a bad girl she became a bad girl somewhere in a big city well it, it was definitely a suggestion that she jumped off the bridge I mean, you see her climbing over the guardrail, and then you see a flower or whatever on the water. I think it was her hat. Or her hat or something. So I can't yeah. that out. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she expressed the need to live her own life. She wanted to have fun. She didn't want to have to take care of this kid who people would make fun of, she thought. So she just wanted to be free. And she that's exactly what Naomi had said uh, before. She wanted to be free. And so she repeated that. Well, but yeah. she also said, I am leaving the Negro race. Right. I mean, that's, yeah, I was going to. That's how she wanted to be free. That was part of it. Yes. I thought she was going to pass for white. She had yeah. very light skin. So I yeah. thought she was going to go to the city and uh, pretend to be white. That's my opinion of, you know, yeah, I don't know if I'm right or not, but I, I, that's what I assumed. Yeah, that's that's what we can assume happened. And then she came back and and you know, obviously whatever she tried to do didn't work or or, or whatever. You know, lots of people go to try to whatever they're trying to do and it doesn't work. So she came home and killed herself, basically. Well, I think that they make this this kind of lesson. There's she looking in the window and she's seeing like all the warmth in the family. And you know, it's like if you try to leave who you who you, you are are yeah. yeah you are not gonna you're gonna be alone i think she was looking in the window and realized that she couldn't have that life either she tried it on the other side that didn't work she came home and that didn't work so 
over yeah. she goes. Right. So she was a misfit her whole life, right? Whatever. Mm, she was yeah. Like. Yeah, that's a good assumption. I, yeah, she was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah. would like to go. I would like to go back for a moment to the language and to the thing. Misha, Alan had a question first. Go ahead. Oh, oh sorry. Um, well, not a question so much, a couple of comments. Maybe others of you probably noticed that the, the hero, Jimmy, and our previous film, Benjamin, had not, were both played by same actor, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Karma Newsom. Um, and in, in both these films, he's just this really fine, upstanding, moral character. And in this one, he has to fight off the gamblers. We, we haven't talked about the gamblers who, you know, are trying to corrupt him. And, uh, you know, he, he makes a hard stand and you know at some point I, I was a little worried that they were going to take him down but um it turns out i think they they honored his position and they left him alone right they let him go yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah he couldn't be corrupted but not by naomi not by the gamblers <laughs> <laughs> uh, and no, also, yeah. did you notice the gamblers, how much blacker they were than everybody? They were bad guys, the gamblers. Yeah, yeah. right. We're talking yeah. about the stereotypical yeah. uh, black character. And I think in this film, it was the gamblers. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. I wanted to, I wanted to comment on um, the very precise intonation of all the characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you notice that it was, I mean, even Naomi, when she was very angry, she was beautifully enunciating. And I think it was, I think that only Jimmy always came out fairly natural, but everybody else struck me as having been really coached how well. well I, I think there's a reason for that, that I brought out a couple yeah. months ago. Yeah. Um, and if you notice, the dialogue is somewhat stilted. <laughs> stilted. It's, yes. it's because, and this is my opinion, and, you know, Bill, you might want to back me up on this or shoot me down on it, you know, um, because you, you've been on the stage before. But it seemed like this was stage language, you know, rather than cinematic language. In other words, That's the dialogue funny. did not low they did not speak the way you would normally speak right the grammar was too good yeah it was too not only the grammar but the the, the grammar the enunciation the pauses between the sentences and stuff like that i got the impression that they were reciting dialogue mm -hmm. rather than speaking dialogue maybe my imagination but it was definitely different and i got the impression that this would work this would have worked very well on the stage but cinematically, it, it leaves something to be desired yeah, a little yeah. bit. I agree with you totally, yes. I, I, Ron, I agree with what you're saying, Ron, um, that the, the dialogue was very stiff and stilted. And the way Naomi said, mommy, mommy, it was so yeah. formal. It, just, it didn't seem natural, but it seemed as though she was acting. But of mm -hmm. course yeah. it was. You know, I've noticed the same thing in the other movies as yeah. well, a couple of the characters, the, the grammar and the enunciation were, was very good throughout all three movies on a number of characters. Do you think it could have been because Michaud was trying to uh, take these characters who were all noble people and hold them up even in front of the general black community to say these people are the best of us because I'm presenting them as being so well-spoken that that he was trying to, to, to supersede even even the own natural stereotypes of the black community. It's a good point. I didn't think of that. You, you could very well be right. I just took the <clears throat> to mean, especially in some of the films we've looked at. Or his writing sucks, one way or the other. Yeah. I, I just thought that they were stage actors that he uh, drew from to act in his movies. And that's we're still working from a script, though. No, oh, no, no. That would not even have been on stage. I, I just took it as hmm. that, that's where. That's where the um, that's where things were in the 30s. It was very stilted. Yeah. But 
So yeah, it's a new it's a new medium. Um, but the other to Bill's point, I'm I'm wondering if he did it purposely because he wanted something so different from what Hollywood was doing with black uh, actors and, and the way they were speaking. Could be, could be. I don't think it's because of the 30s because if you look at non-black films in the 30s, they're speaking naturally. I mean, there, there are lots of examples of that. And yet Mitchell is, you know, his films and other black films are exactly what we're talking about. The dialogue is different. So these are all good points that I never thought of. Maybe you were right in saying that Mitchell did this so that black people would look up to the good characters in the film and down to the bad characters or the characters he wanted you to feel were bad because their speech is different. Well, consider this, Ron. There yeah. is a parallel, there's a parallel in white movies at the time too. If hmm. you watch 30s movies, especially early 30s movies, it yeah. seems that everybody that lived in this country because of the depression was rich and going to dinner parties and spoke with like phony British accents. Yeah. Lots of movies in the 30s <laughs> were about rich people and it was all targeted to make the hoi polloi not feel so bad about their cruddy lives in the depression. They go to the movies, they wanna see you know rich people. But all those actors sounded like they had British accents and they didn't. And if you see the same people 10 years later, they didn't sound like that anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that could have been, he might have been doing that for the same reason that the mainstream filmmakers were doing that with white accents. That could be. Yeah. Like I said, I don't know. And that's that's a, a very good analysis. That's a, a, a very good idea. I'll have to think about that, but that sounds good to me. You know, that sounds very good. Yeah, I didn't think of that. Well, I, I, Bill, I would I like you to agree. say again. Uh, sorry, I forget about your hands, Bill. Bill, I would like you to think about just maybe two titles that uh, were in the 30s uh, where the characters were speaking with British accent. I cannot think of anything right now, and I do love the pre code uh, uh, movies a lot. I, don't, I cannot think of anybody. Well, it's kind of the precursor. I don't know if it's a British accent or just an upper crust American accent where basically you're speaking through your nose or whatever. I mean, you know, it's an affected accent that people have or had that, and you're quite right, Bill, the, uh, the old, um, you know, uh, nightclub dinner party, everybody's in a tuxedo drinking champagne, you know, it's 1932 or whatever, and you know, this sort of thing. And they're speaking with what I would call an upper crust accent that nobody was born with. You know, it, it does sound pseudo British, but I just took it as an upper crust type of snooty accent <laughs> that uh, people had to distinguish themselves from the hoi polloi down below. You know, that's just a think about early Catherine Hepburn versus later Catherine Hepburn. That's true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a Wellesleyan accent. Yes, it's definitely it's, East Coast. It's definitely an Ivy League East, East Coast. Coast. Yeah. New England, upper crust, Harvard, you know, that's that sort of thing. So uh, it's still used, I think, but. Uh, yes, I had a couple of friends that speak it. Yeah, but I always got the impression it was affected. It's not something you're born with. It's something you emulate. So I just had an article put in front of me about what's called mid-Atlantic accent and that it was a, a part of theatrical training between the 20s and the 40s and was uh, referred to as world English. And um, uh, it was used, it was a popular affectation on stage and, and other forms of high culture in North America. Yeah. The, the codification of a mid-Atlantic accent in writing, particularly for theatrical training is credited to one woman who uh, was an instructor. So it was something that um, people were trained to do and it was referred to as a, a mid-Atlantic accent. Yeah, and the, the word you used was affected, which is what I guessed, you know, you had to learn how to do this. And I think the black equivalent of that is what you see in the quote unquote good characters in all of these films. They speak yeah. proper English, you know, they're not in any way stereotypical, they dress well, you know, uh, and, and so on and so forth. I'll just I'll just add that she um, she was um, 
uh, she wrote a textbook on in 1942 about how to speak this way and taught at the Carnegie Institute of Technology and later at Juilliard. Uh, what was her name? Her name was uh, Skinner, Edith Warman Skinner. Not oh, B.F. Skinner. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not being married to him. Uh, Speaking Ruthie, about Ruthie was trying to say something before. Oh, thank you. Thanks. I um, right away I saw um, some parallels between the 1930s depression movies that were mainstream studio films in terms of the uh, there were very very suggestions that there was anything wrong in these people's worlds in the material sense. Mm -hmm. Everyone was comfortable. Everyone was well dressed, and the fact that entertainment entered the plot as frequently as it did was also reflected in white studio film of the time. Yeah, I think I mentioned a couple of months ago. As, as well, like as, yeah, uh, if you're on a bread line, you know, you don't want to see in the movies people on bread lines. You want to look up and That's right. at the fact that after the movie, you got to stand on a bread line. So you're looking at Fantasy. I, I think I mentioned a couple of months ago, if you're familiar with Busby Berkeley, I mean, what's more, you know, unrealistic and, you know, fantastical than having, you know, a hundred, you know, platinum blondes playing the violin photographed from above, you know, dancing in unison. I mean, you know, you're not likely to see that um, all the way up to the Wizard of Oz in the late 30s. I mean, you're looking at you know, uh, a lot of fantasy, not completely. Or Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers dancing blithely under the moonlight, you know, in some, you know, uh, dance floor somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. And that's uh, that's likely to take your mind off the bread lines and the fact that you don't have a job and, and, and so on and so forth. So, yeah. yeah. You know, it's and, funny and today... The only thing that I, that I could that I could even take as a suggestion that it was a depression film was the fact that the first mother gave up Naomi yeah. because her life was desperate and they were hungry. So, um, okay. yeah. yeah, and that was really the only suggestion. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say that it's interesting that um, today that dynamic is completely the other way around. Today, people don't wanna see you know, and it, with, with whatever suffering everybody's going on with, that's what they want to see. They want to go out and they want to see their own lives reflected in film today. Mm. They don't want to see movies about people who are doing phenomenally better than they are. Yeah. You're right. I mean, it goes back and forth. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that kind of started in the 50s where uh, aside from war movies, you know, World War II is now over. So now we're looking at that a little bit. You're looking at ordinary people you know, uh, rather than looking up at, uh, you know, people that are better than you are. And I think, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think aside from the science fiction stuff that you're looking at, you are looking at people who uh, are far more down to earth. Alan? <laughs> We're talking about the, uh, this fancy accent uh, and a character that came to my mind immediately, I'm a, a Marx Brothers fan, is Margaret Dumont. Yeah. Um, yes. She really yes. had this yes. really high society. And I, I just pulled her up on the internet and she was born in Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know if she grew up with the accent that she used uh, when, when she was going up against Groucho. Yeah. Well, she's a good example of a stereotypical upper crust, whatever, that the Marsh Brothers ran all over. I mean, she was the perfect right. developer. <laughs> so, uh, well, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Um, I have a question. I seem to recall that uh, last time or the first time you talked about how some of the dance scenes were um, plugged in in a way so that they could either be part of the film or just cut out. Do you remember? Talking about that? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like in this film, the um, dance scenes didn't seem very related to the rest of the film. And I just wondered if it was kind of a, a similar situation. Probably not. Man, you're looking at a Black film that'd be watched by Black people who would have liked to see, you know, yeah. the diversion of, of people dancing. Um, 
And uh, I, I think I mentioned earlier, and it's a guess on my part, that, that, that those scenes are there just to entertain, you know, entertainment relief. That's it, because it's a very dramatic and very serious topic that this movie is based on. And uh, so, and, and black people were, back then we used to looking at people dance and be entertained and, or entertain and, and, and such like that. So I think in all the movies we've seen so far, somebody's dancing somewhere. And I think I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, Mitchell created a nightclub scene just so they could dance. Otherwise, the dancing would have <laughs> made no sense at all. You know, although in one of the dancing sequences, there is some, uh, you know, dialogue going on where the, um, the mother is talking uh, about the uh, closeness between the you know, brother and the stepsister and that's and that's going on she's noticing something that his fiance does not notice you know this sort of thing she's picking up these vibes so in between the dancing they switch to you know these three people that are talking about this and uh so yeah she 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 smelled something here. Something is going on and, you know, whatever. And now we're back to, you know, watching people dance and-, and Yeah, but, but the people Ron, who are watching dance, it, it, she, she's, she's seeing Naomi and Jimmy dance together. I mean, it's the fact that they're, the, the scene makes sense. It makes it sense does, they're in a sense. nightclub and they're dancing and there's yeah. professional dancing and- yeah. Yeah. It, the, the yeah song, I don't, Ron, I don't think those I don't think those nightclub song uh, scenes were thrown in just to provide dancing and maybe a little bit of dialogue. I think every time we went to the nightclub, uh, the nightclub, it advances the story significantly. Yeah. The okay. first time, uh -huh. the first time when Jimmy and what's your name go to the the, the nightclub, that's kind of showing that they're seriously going out together. They're hanging out in these high class places, and there's dancing going on there. Not just the people dancing, but performances to show that this ain't just a bar. This is a real high class place. And then later on, when they all go to the nightclub, and we have that scene with with uh, the, the the girlfriend's mother and the and you know and Jimmy and and what's her name Naomi. Yeah, and there's, there's a lot of story development there. So I think those those nightclub scenes yeah. were pretty integral to the plot. Yeah, I, I agree. So uh, whoever asked about the you know whether those scenes could be taken out as in other films, uh, you know, my answer was no, and Bill elaborated on that more than I thought, but yeah, the answer is no, they belong there. Um, but there were films where, uh, you know, and but the films we're talking about where the dancing could be taken out are mainstream Hollywood films that white people were more likely to see than black people, okay? So when these films played in the South, those dance scenes could be pulled because presumably, you know, Southerners did not want to see, you know, uh, black people having fun or whatever, you know, this sort of thing. Um, or they could be put in where Northern people who did want to see that and it did not disrupt the plot. Those scenes okay. could be removed without disrupting the storyline at all. And what Bill is saying, um, and he's, he's quite right about that for reasons I didn't even think of, is that, yeah, these, um, you know, these, uh, you know, nightclub scenes actually belong there. You know, they do advance the plot. Famously, Alan mentioned Margaret Dumont a little while ago. The, the One of the best of the Margaret Dumont Marx Brothers movies was Day at the Races. And there's a 10 minute scene in the middle of Day at the Races where they're hiding from the bad guys and they go to the barn next door. And there's like a, a 10 minute dance scene with uh, Ron. What was the name of that group? Because we've talked about that. Whitey's uh, Indy Hoppers. Indy Hoppers. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. and, and that whole scene that whole scene, it's a 10 minute dance scene. And that scene was yanked out to play in the South. So yeah. that, there's an example of somebody wants to see something like that, go check out Day at the Races. And it's funny, Linda and Chester up there can uh, attest to this. That's the one scene we do watch at Day at the Races. I mean, that scene is shown to just about every Lindy Hopper. That and, you know, the scene in Hell's a Poppin' where they're basically doing the same thing. You know, another scene that could be taken out and inserted back in at, at will. Uh, but today, those scenes, are, I, I've seen those scenes a million times, um, just from dance class and, you know, things of that nature. Also, um, that's a, a, an example of 
a, a scene that didn't originally exist in the script. They stuck it in there because I believe it was the director that uh, discovered Whitey's Lindy Hopper's dancing somewhere uh, on the West Coast and basically came up with a scene to have them in the movie. Mm. So it's a made up scene. It's a totally that there's no other reason for the, the main characters to go to that barn except that there's there's a lot of black dancers there. Yeah. <laughs> and just one other thing about that, whenever you see black dancers like that, and again, this is Whitey's Lindy Hoppers, notice how they're dressed. You know, they're dressed in overalls and dirty clothes and, you know, whatever, and so on and so forth. Um, you never see in a quote unquote white film, black people dressed up as anything, unless you're talking about the butler or the elevator boy or something like that. So in these scenes where they're dancing, they're dancing in cover roles. They're born workers. They're, you know, they're, they're working in the fields and now they... You know, I call it the, you know, ain't we got fun syndrome that you, mm -hmm. you see from, uh, you know, about black people in, in white films and this sort of thing. So uh. it, it's interesting that in in those in the, the studio films that they did identify Whitey's Lindy Hoppers by their various names um, mm -hmm. as a group. They didn't identify each individual dancers. We no. know who they are. And what, by the way, one of them just passed away. Um, but. The, uh, but in the black film, they didn't identify the dancers. Yeah, they, yeah. So I, they did not realize that or recognize that or notice that, but yeah, you know. Uh, and you notice that in Mitchell's films, though, they, those dancers, I don't think got credit. No, that's yeah. what I'm saying. They're, 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 they're not. I they're look, not, they're not they're credited. Not credited no. Yeah. So, uh, so. Other comments? Okay, uh, go ahead, uh, John. I just, I was waiting more towards the end of this because this is, it's on topic, but it's slightly off because they are not lower budget black made films. One was sort of a studio B film yeah. and one was a later true Hollywood kind of film. Both of them are called Imitation of Life that did come up earlier. I think Misha and somebody else mentioned it. Yeah. The first one is 1934, and 25 years later, they did a remake. They really changed the story. But the important thing is the relationship between the black mother and the daughter that passes in both of them. And it's just amazing performances by the two actors that played the black mothers. In 1934, it was Louise Beavers. Louise Beavers, yes. Yeah, and in 1959, it was Juanita Moore. Another yeah. very acclaimed in their time. And if you really want to see a heart rendering kind of story on passing, both of these do it. I mean, you can forget the Hollywood glitz in the later one, but if you concentrate on the relationships, I, I think they're just amazing. And there's one other movie I can mention, 1949. Um, oh, I, I just lost the name of Pinky. Yes, I've seen that. Yeah. Pinky. Um, yeah. And here's a, uh, she's played by a white woman, but a very light skinned black who passes for white, basically. And, uh, you know, she falls in love with a white man, vice versa, and all of that. And the controversy is, all right, now let's meet the parents. And, you know, so yeah. how's this going to play? And the, so there were a number of movies that did that. But understand, not many. That's a very, very touchy subject on Jobo. both sides of the color line. So it's... Jobo, really, Ron. Yeah. Showboat. <laughs> Showboat. Showboat. It's, it's part of the story in Showboat. Yeah, that's true. That is true in both versions of Showboat, 1936, 1951, I think. Yeah, you know, but um, yeah, it's it, it's a tough subject to, uh, and not many people were willing to, uh, you know, to tackle that because it is controversial. Um, I just wanted to say, um, I had not, I didn't, I never saw Imitation of Life and I didn't know about it until after I saw, after Chester, I watched this and then he said about Imitation of Life and it was too late to, to get it and watch it before this. So we're going to watch it later. But um, I don't, so I don't know if this is true in those versions, but in this one, I was really struck how the white girl was evil. Yeah. Well, for that, you should watch the 1934 version of the Imitation of Life. 
because I, I'm actually it is better than the uh, uh, Cirque. Um, uh, and you will see really how there is something in that girl. <laughs> yeah, I've got to watch it. I haven't seen it either. I've heard of it, but I've never seen it. So. so she's portrayed as evil as well in The Imitation of Life? The second movie for sure. Or, or you know, not like murder is evil, but evil. Mm. Um, yeah. And I now forget the 19th, Misha might remember the 1934 version. I don't think she's as evil as the 1959 per, uh, person. Mm. I think Misha disappeared. Oh yeah, she's gone. She's gone. It's too bad. Uh, yeah, I've got to watch it. I I have yeah. seen either of them. I've heard of the first one though. Yeah, Ron, Bevan was going to be here, but I see she didn't make it because uh, I have a, a DVD that has both on it, and she asked me to find it for her for this week. So I do have them. If you oh. don't, I think the later one is available free on YouTube, but not the 1934 one. Which reminds me, um, I was going to bring this up also at the end. Uh, the next two movies, I want, uh, I, I wanted to get a western in, and uh, it, it's tough to do. I, I found two of them on YouTube, both by Mitchell, and uh, one of them is uh, I'm not going to show it only because it's a western, only in the fact that it takes place in the West. There are automobiles in this one, so I didn't count for me. Um, and the other one um, is a Western. Um, it's called Harlem uh, Rides the Range. <laughs> and, uh, okay. And uh, it's, uh, I, I only picked it because it's a Western and I want to see how people, because I knew there were Black Westerns. It's just that I couldn't find any. You know, they may not be available, um, whatever, or maybe I just didn't do enough research on it. Um, but anyway, you know, see the movie. Um, I really want to talk about the February movie because the movie I had planned for February for a while is Stormy Weather. And you can't get it for free on YouTube or anywhere for that matter. You can rent it, you know, for as little as a dollar. You can buy it for as little as like four or five dollars or more, you know, depending on where you get it. Um, but even though you're going to have to, you know, put out, a dollar or two to get it. I highly recommend this movie. It is an all black movie, but the production is all white. Um, it's uh, really an entertainment movie. You know, uh, basically it is nothing like any of the movies that we've seen so far, um, but it's just a fun movie to watch, especially the last scene, which I'm not gonna give away. So I'll, I'll say more about it um, in January you know, when we meet again, but I, I would really like for everybody to do what they can. And, you know, if I can come up with information on the cheapest way to get the movie, and uh, I don't know if the library has it or, you know, whatever, I have my copy, I have a VHS copy of it that I wouldn't mind lending to people after I see the movie first, because I haven't seen it in years, um, this sort of thing. But uh, that's what I'm thinking for February. And uh, I'll, I'll talk more about it uh, you know, uh, next month. Uh, you might try trying to see if you can find it between now and then or whatever, and I'll do some research to see if I can help you out with it. But, um, you know, I, I highly recommend that movie. But the next movie will be Harlem Rides the Range. Uh, we should have it in the newsletter, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. And you've got a month to, you know, take a look at it and see what you think. Um, and I, like I said, I, I think a Western is a good departure from what we have been looking at, you know, so uh, that'll be for next month. Any last comments? Any, any, for the good discussion, people, you guys have, uh, like I knew you would, came up with stuff I didn't even think about. Uh, my my laptop up. just crashed. My laptop just crashed. What did you say will be the next movie? The next movie is Harlem Rides the Range, which is a, an all black Western. It is not an Oscar Mitchell movie. It's a Spencer Williams movie, who is another actor slash, you know, cinematographer, not on the order of Mitchell, but certainly a, a contemporary. And if you're old enough to remember the old Amos and Andy series in the early 50s, he played Andy, okay, in hmm. that series. He's also in the movie. So more about that, uh, you know, next month. 
Any other, any last comments? Yeah, I have a question. Shoot. Um, maybe, maybe a short conversation about this short uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. What do you think the title meant? We've been talking about it here. Um, <laughs> she was not anybody's stepdaughter or stepchild. She was an adopted child. She wasn't a stepsister. She wasn't a stepdaughter. So who are God's stepchildren? Who was Michelle I, talking about? I thought that was just the blacks in general. Yeah, right. I, I thought he was talking about the, the people who were not stepchildren. I thought he talk, was talking about the children who had no power in any of this and any of the machinations uh, that the adults are doing or, or, or whatever. And their stepchildren in the sense that you know, the parents, the grownups who are, are doing like really strange things and, and whatever, you know, and the children are just children. I could be wrong, you know, but that, that was my take on it. Can I be heard? Yes. Well, okay, yes. I don't see, I've lost my screen. Um, I just finished reading The Invisible Man mm -hmm. and um, that feels like it could have been written today. Is that about Ralph Ellison's book? Yes, yeah. and it was written in 1947, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I took that title, this title, as the second class of citizens that, mm -hmm. you know, that blacks have been relegated to by whites. Sure. And, and any black that is of higher class or whatever is invisible. We don't yeah. see them. Or even not it. I mean, you're invisible if you're not even higher class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or you couldn't be treated the way people have been treated. That's true. Yeah, that was the purpose of Ellison's book. I read that years ago in college. It's dehumanizing yeah. of, mm -hmm. of, but it's so relevant today. I was just struck and I really mixed up that with Native Son, mm -hmm. which I'm going to read next, <laughs> which I haven't read for 45 years or 50. Oh. Yeah, well, another stretch is the fact that, you know, beginning in the 60s and even right up to now, uh, Black people are no longer invisible. In fact, we're in your face. Right, right. In a lot of controversy and, you know, read the newspapers. I mean, and, and that's the thing. That's the whole idea behind Black power. Power is recognition. I'm thinking, why am I so oblivious to so much? Well, I was born in 1947. You know, I was lost in my own little narrow world. Mm-hmm. Well, so was I, and I beat you by a year, uh, <laughs> but I was born in the black community. So right. you're very aware, if you're black, of how you're perceived, uh, not only by white people, by, uh, but by other black people. You know, there was a, a thing where, you know, you're not black enough. You know, this goes back to the 60s, where if you didn't have an Afro out to wherever and wearing a dashiki down past your knees, you weren't really black. Right. You, know, you were trying to assimilate and this sort of thing. So, yeah, you know, so yeah, I, I, I see your point. I take your point. Living so getting back to the question of what that has to do with the title of the, of the film. So, yeah. Could it the, be, the title. Uh, uh, yeah. Go ahead. I'm Go sorry. Ahead. Bill. There's a 1924 book called God's Stepchildren by oh. Sarah Gertrude Millen. It has nothing to do with this, but it is a, about apartheid in South Africa. Uh-huh. Huh. Oh, okay. Maybe he took it from that. I, I don't know. That's it seems to really seems like it might. She coined the phrase. Could be. So, Sarah, do you know Sarah that, or are you sitting in front of a keyboard? I used my phone to look that up. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things we were one of the things we were thinking about here was perhaps that because Naomi was was <clears throat> because she was of mixed race, that maybe even to the black people she wasn't as good as they were. So she was kind of God's stepchild. She wasn't even one of us. That could be. Ron, if you don't mind me saying us, then, then maybe yeah, she but was... she's the main money. She's the main manipulator in the story. She is, but even That's in the black her. community, if you had lighter skin, you know, you were looked up to, but you were looked down on as well. In other words, how come we're both black? How come you get the privileges and I don't simply because your skin is a lighter shade than mine? So there was that sentiment in the black community when I was growing up, and I'm sure it must have been personified in the, uh, you know, back in the 30s and 20s and, and whatever. So it gets. Yeah, but I'll bet, I'll bet in the pantheon of evil, I'll bet you a mixed race trumps a, uh, you know, light skinned 
So yeah. people probably look down more on people of kids of mixed race than they did on just light skinned black kids. Right, because it was against the law, you know, until whatever, 1950s, what was that? In Virginia. And I, and I suspect going back to, yeah, and I suspect going back to the, one of the first questions that was asked tonight about why that woman dropped off Naomi with Mrs. Saunders, was it? Saunders. Was that, was that and, and it was a white child, that she knew that her life was going to be difficult enough. Yeah. And even outside the movies at that time, I'm sure black women had, single black women had a, a much harder time if Absolutely. they had white children than if they had just being single and black children. Well, keep in, you're, you're absolutely right. And keep in mind that if you're black with light skin, you've got choices that, you know, darker people don't have, but those choices are dangerous. And, you know, you must go through a whole lot considering, you know, whether or not you take those choices or not. Naomi, in my in, interpretation of the film, takes the choice of passing for white. Now, whether she actually does or she, she jumps off a bridge, I, I don't know. But you know, consider making that choice or at least thinking about the fact that you have a choice. Whereas if your skin is a lot darker, there's no choice to be made. Anyone else? Okay, well, once again, I, I thank you uh, very much. A very lively discussion. I, I learned as much from you as maybe you learned from me or whatever, but it's the film that's teaching all of us and you know, giving us all ideas uh, to think about, you know, food for thought. Um, hope to see you next month and uh, we'll have another discussion. Once again, I have to thank John you know, Giralico, the director of Elting uh, Library. Um, uh, Jesse, thank you very much for you know doing what you did, keeping order when I didn't, and uh, you know just being behind the scenes and you know uh, doing all the things that someday I'll learn how to do. Uh, and no problem. And uh, you know, hopefully, I'll I'll see you all uh, next month, and we'll have another uh, similar. We event. just want to thank you, Ron. We thank love you, Ron. that you're doing this. We've really enjoyed this. We're glad it's continuing. I think you do an absolutely amazing job. I love watching and listening to you, even on the screen. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. I love doing it. And, uh, you know, I almost hope that, <laughs> I almost hate to end it in February. And we may talk about that. But uh, uh, thank you, John. I appreciate it. And like I say, I learn um, at least as much from all of you as maybe you learn from me. So see you next month. Thanks, Ron. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks, Ron. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Very Good night. Thank you.